So uh, a while back, uh, people were talking about this, uh, this new way of getting connected to the world. Uh, people out in the middle of nowhere, like uh, Meadow Vista, um, with, <laughs> with uh, less than, than adequate um, tin cans and string trying to get you on the internet. Uh, and Alan ended up being one of the um, first people, he's down in Placerville uh, area, and uh, got on the Starlink uh, beta system and uh, has some experiences he thought he wants to, to, to share with the group. So I thought, hey, let's, let's um, you know, a lot of people are kind of in the same situation as he is. Uh, and um, maybe he could uh, use some uh, ex uh, the just information on it and stuff. Alan's a long time uh, uh, ham of the area and uh, does, has been in a lot of things with the um, uh, uh, cell phone industry in terms of uh, cell sites and, and that kind of stuff. So. Great, uh, great resource, technical resource uh, for the area. Uh, Alan, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here, Greg. Can you hear me okay. all right? Very good. Um, so what is this thing and uh, how does it work? Okay, it looks like that's up. Um, yeah, and uh, Greg, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me uh, come over and uh, uh, talk with the group tonight by Zoom. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I'm actually not in the cell phone industry. I'm, I'm in the satellite internet industry. I do a lot of commercial uh, satellite systems, uh, both for HughesNet and then for other companies that uh, uh, do enterprise level work for, you know, Big Five and Merrill Lynch and Bank of America. And it kind of keeps me hopping. So, um, you know, I'm just interested in, in internet and satellite internet uh, because it's, it's, it's my profession. So. Uh, last year, I think around June, I had a chance to sign up on the beta list uh, at, uh, for the Starlink system. And uh, at that time, they didn't take any money. You just put your name in there, and then that was it. And I sort of forgot about it. And then February, I got an email, February of uh, this year, um, got an email on February 5th, and the, uh, the email said, uh, well, your, your chance is here. Uh, you can purchase the system, and uh, you can get this now. And uh, we only have a limited number of systems. And I pounced on it. I didn't even think about it. Um, and it was, it was not cheap. It was $500 uh, plus another $88 in tax and shipping. So it was about $588 altogether. <clears throat> but I went ahead and ordered it and uh, took them about uh, two to three weeks uh, for that to arrive. And I'm kind of uh, going to try and jump through here. And by the way, I've got this uh, saved as a PDF. And um, I'll have some links at the end of this so people can, can uh, uh, follow up on some of the material I'm going to share with you because I'm going to try and breeze through. I know we're running pretty late here. Was it 921? All right, so let's move on in here. So uh, this is what I got. Um, let's see if my click on this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the unboxing. And this is how this thing comes in a big box, weighs about mm, 25 pounds. And all the pieces are in here, and it it's already pre-assembled. Uh, the cable is attached to the dish. There is a stand. Uh, there is a little pole that goes onto that stand, and it just clicks onto there. And then uh, you can see what the finished product looks like here. Uh, this is actually the dish in the stowed position. And then right behind it there, that little white thing, that is a wireless access point. And then right behind that cable roll, is a power supply, which I thought was just uh, kind of like a typical power brick, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And that's a hundred, that's a hundred feet of uh, of uh, outdoor rated uh, Cat Six cable that this thing comes with, already pre-assembled. So uh, fairly quick to get this up and running. Um, this is the stuff inside the house, and you'll see that access point on the right, and then the power brick on the left, and. Um, I assumed that that power brick and that access point were uh, was the modem because that's my frame of reference with HughesNet systems is that there is a computer that sits inside the house and uh, boy was I wrong and I'm going to get to that in a bit and you can put this pretty much any place outside you need to have a good clear view of the uh, northern sky which is opposite of what we do for like direct TV and DISH Network and HughesNet, where we're pointing towards the south uh, to satellites over the equator, these satellites are moving and they are overhead and there's a lot of them. So it just needs a big wide swath of sky. And you can see here's this, uh, <laughs> here's, 
here's this guy putting one up on a pole. Uh, and this is a, a good example of why uh, women live a lot longer than men. And you can see that guy's wife down there holding the ladder. He better hope that she loves him because uh, she is in control at this moment. So, uh, but you can put it almost anywhere. And I, I started out with it over at, this is one of the two houses that's on our property. Uh, this is where we live. And then my sister's house is uh, just south of us. So this was the first location I had. And I had to kind of get this back a little bit because I have some large oak trees towards the north. And then I, what I did is I moved it up to uh, the other house where my sister lives. And this is actually where I've got my antennas because this is also where my ham shack is. So there's a, a couple of vertical antennas there and then uh, there's an off center fed dipole there in the back. And so here it's sitting now. And this is actually, it's just uh, at the point where I've just deployed it out there. And you can see I'm really doing a very uh, thorough and complete installation. I've got a concrete block up there and that's all I'm using to hold this thing down because I'm not sure where I'm gonna end up yet. So I'm not gonna drill it into the roof. This system is self-positioning. You put it up, you plug it in, and then it finds the satellite. So there's no, there's no pointing that's involved with this. Um, and it has a couple of servo motors. This is the backside of the antenna with the, there's a cowl that's on there that uh, in this picture it's removed. And there are two servo motors that run this whole thing. So that plate, that pizza pan there, about 16, 17 inches or so, it actually will spin on that, uh, that axis as well as tilt. So it's a fully agile as L mount there. And um, so you're gonna see right here, uh, that's that thing sitting there. And then right to the right of it there, this is a little video. I just managed to run up on the roof and crap, uh, just, just grab a, uh, a short snippet of a movie of this thing actually self positioning. Uh, so let me see if I can. There it goes. So now on its own, it is, uh, um, it, first of all, it's got GPS built into it. So it's using GPS to figure out where it is in the world. And then it also figures out where those satellites are gonna be at any given moment. So it's trying to pre-position itself and get ready to pick up some signals from these satellites. And then as, it, as these satellites come overhead, it starts to calibrate itself. And this is, an un, this, <laughs> this is a little bit more than an unboxing. This guy, Ken Kiter, uh, actually, uh, he's, a, he's an IT uh, systems engineer guy. And he decided that he was not only going to unbox the system, he was also going to tear it apart. So he's, his $588 system is now in pieces. And this is the antenna. And this is what astonished me when I found this out. This is a computer board that is inside here. This is a phased array antenna. There are several small pieces of phased array uh, antenna parts that are on there, as well as all these IC circuits. All of the intelligence for this system is in the, the dish face itself. And this just this just astonished me when I when I saw this. And it, it, we're kind of drilling in here a little bit, and you just see what's going on here. There's just tons and tons of ICs on here. Some real cutting edge technology that this thing is using. And then he even uh, unpotted uh, some of the. Uh, I see here so I could see what was going on in there. And uh, there is a video of him uh, doing this uh, teardown. So, and I've got a link to that video uh, if anybody wants to watch it, it's just fascinating. But he really had to rip this thing apart and it was difficult to disassemble it. Um, you know, $500 dish, I gotta believe that guy must be a ham radio operator because who else would tear apart $500 worth of equipment just to see how it operates. Okay, this is an app that lives on the phone and uh, you download this app, the Starlink app, and it allows you to do uh, a number of things. It helps you set it up. It has a little uh, viewing window there in that second frame. You can see that blue sky in there. So you, you try to find a spot where you've got nothing but uh, blue sky in that little oval window there and that to, to help you uh, put that where it's supposed to be. And then it will also tell you that it's offline and online and you can see those two shots there. And then it will also tell you, it, it takes about uh, 12 hours for it to figure out where it is and to start compiling data, but it will tell you if it's obstructed. And this shot here is from where I first had it located and it was telling me that towards the north, I was getting some obstruction. And that's, this is when it prompted me to move it to the next location. And here, it also has some ping statistics. 
Uh, it will keep track of latency. Uh, also keep track of the download usage and the upload usage. And uh, you can see that in the last, I don't know if you can read that or not, but in the last five hours, the system was obstructed for 13 minutes and there were no satellites for two minutes. And the beta downtime for this system was 10 minutes. So uh, just it's really keeping some, some good stats and probably this stuff is all getting uh, radioed back to uh, Elon Musk's uh, mothership, I'm sure. And then here's some more statistics here, download usage, upload usage, and then signal to noise ratio. So again, I'll have this in the slide deck. Here's some speed tests. So uh, these speeds were all over the map. And the reason why is because when I first put this system up, they maybe had about a thousand satellites up. And these are circling all over the earth. So there's gonna be some times when it's not gonna be, uh, I'm not gonna have satellites uh, or very many satellites overhead. So. I would run speed tests and take screenshots. This is 10 megabits here. A uh, little bit better here, 64 megabits. You can also see the uh, unloaded and loaded latency there running in from 35 meg uh, milliseconds to 201 milliseconds. And then the upload speed was at 19 megabits per second. Uh, to give you some uh, scope of comparison to a HughesNet system, with a HughesNet system, you're lucky if you can get maybe 25 megabits down and one to two megabits up. That's kind of typical of most of the systems that I see. Uh, this system really beats it uh, on those uh, uh, key metrics. Here's another speed test at 180 megabits per second down, uh, 34 milliseconds unloaded, and uh, upload speed of 9.3 megabits per second. That's pretty darn fast. And the latency is really good. On a HughesNet system, you're gonna see latency of anywhere from uh, 600 milliseconds up to 900 milliseconds, simply because it's using geosync satellites. They're 22,300 miles out over the equator. It's a 90,000 mile round trip for the signals to get up to the satellite, down to the ground at the far end, and then back up to you to make that round trip. And so, you know, we can blame Einstein for uh, setting the speed of light so low. But uh, certainly the Starlink system helps cut through that. And here's one more speed test. 230 megabits per second. So this thing will really scream. The main thing at this point is because it is in beta, uh, they're still playing around with this. They are still tinkering with the software. They're still uh, downloading updates. Uh, they're doing some repositioning with some of the satellites. Uh, they're launching more satellites. Every uh, a few weeks or so, they launch another 60 satellites up there. And here's a, this is a screenshot from this site. I'm gonna see if I can go, get on this site here to show you this, but you'll see this, there's this big long string of satellites that's going from the top left down to the lower right. That's actually a deployment that has not been uh, put out there yet. They're, the ones that are just kind of randomly scattered around, they are deployed, but this is from a recent launch, this big string. There's about 60 satellites in that string. And then uh, after they're satisfied that everything is up and running, then they start positioning these individual satellites to their uh, final uh, orbital slots. You know, let's see if we can get on this thing here. Okay, there it is. All right, so you can see this moving dynamically. It's actually, this is real time right now with these satellites passing overhead. These things are ripping along. They're only up about 300 miles, about 500 kilometers. And so they've got to be moved pretty fast just to keep their orbital slots. Those red lines you see, that's the satellites I'm talking through right now on those two satellites that are both crossing over Oregon. And you'll see that dynamically it's gonna start switching this. You might think of this like when you're driving down the road and you get, you're talking on the cell phone, so you're moving. And then as you pass by these cell phone towers, your traffic is being handed off from one cell phone tower to another. These are like moving cell phone towers that are in space. And, um, it, and it can have as many as four or five of these connected at the same time. So it, it's always, I mean, the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, processing power that must be behind this is just, uh, it must be enormous uh, to keep all track of all this stuff. And of course, these satellites, they know where the other satellites are. They're all talking to each other, just like when you see drones flying in formation. They're all communicating with each other so that they don't, uh, they don't run into each other. And that there is, uh, you know, quite a job with just keeping these things uh, separate. And here's a video of these, these, this is a group of satellites that are 
um, being deployed, but they're not quite deployed yet. They've been launched. There's 60 of them. They've been dumped out of the bay of the uh, uh, Falcon Heavy rocket. And then uh, you should be able to see that this is actually what this looks like. And in our area, occasionally you can see them just like this, usually about uh, dusk in the evening. I'll get a little ad here too. Um, and this is when the sun is shining at just the right angle at the darkened sky behind them, but the sun is reflecting off of the solar panels on the unit. Now, there's not as, it's not as easy to see them now as it was when they first launched because they got a lot of complaints from astronomers about uh, the light from these guys. Anybody doing a time-lapse photography uh, could get their photography ruined by having this string of lights go right through the north. So um, they have since then tried to reposition these things to, to uh, 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 mitigate that problem. And I'm going to just go ahead and move on past this. I know we're unfairly late here, and I don't want to take up too much time with it. All the links to these videos are in my resource box. All right, and I'm going to play a little bit of this video. This is about a 10 minute video. I don't want to play too much of it, but this is a fascinating video. This is all computer generated simulations of how this constellation of satellites is running. And you're going to notice a few things here. Uh, first of all, the, the first batch of satellites that they've launched are really just designed to communicate from ground to earth. And they've got a number of ground stations all over the place, right? So, but their next set of launches that are going to, I think they've already started in here are going to have lasers on board and the lasers are going to allow these satellites to communicate from one satellite to the other directly. And so this makes kind of like a mesh network uh, that just improves the performance and also uh, uh, has some implications for how far this system can reach. So let's see if we can get this one going. In May 2019, SpaceX launched the first 60 satellites of their hugely ambitious Starlink Low Earth Orbit Constellation. Is the audio going? These are followed in November by another 60 satellites. Right. They plan to launch another 60 around the end of the year. Well, I don't know exactly how SpaceX plans to operate this constellation. That's we get quite a bit of information from their FCC the filings that, and from uh, public comments by Elon Musk and Gwyn In this video, I'm going to look at how such a constellation might work, given what we know at the moment. Bear in mind, I don't have any inside information, so this is what they could do if they wanted to, but probably isn't what they'll actually do. This is the underside of one of the first Starlink satellites. Those grey panels are phased array antennas, and they allow the satellite to steer very narrow radio beams, so it can communicate with many ground stations at the same time, without needing to move a dish around as it passes by at 27,000 km per hour. The same principles used by modern Wi-Fi base stations, while they use just a few antennas to focus power in the general direction of your phone, each of those grey panels consists of a hundred or more small antennas. They can focus a radio beam only a couple of degrees wide. They can also steer a beam a long way to the side. According to FCC filings, a ground station should be able to communicate with a satellite when it's only 25 degrees above the horizon. OK, so what about the constellation itself? In November 2018, SpaceX revised their constellation plans lowering the orbits of the first phase satellites to 550 kilometers and spreading the satellites into 24 orbital planes with 66 satellites in each plane. Now, they've since revised those plans again, and I'll come back to that later. But for now, let's look at this constellation. SpaceX originally planned to use free space laser links between the satellites. The idea is that data goes up to a satellite using those radio beams, then hop satellite to satellite using lasers, and then down again using radio. As the speed of light in a vacuum is about 50% faster than it is in glass, communications latency via Starlink would be significantly less than via optical fiber. The problem is that those laser links are pushing the state of the art, and satellites launched so far don't have any lasers. This has led to a lot of speculation that Starlink won't be any good for wide area communications, at least until lasers eventually get deployed. But I think that's wrong, and I'll show you why. Looking at this diagram again, if two places are far enough apart, but covered by the same satellite, it's actually faster to go via the satellite at the speed of light in a vacuum than it is to go via fiber at the speed of light in glass. This means it might still be possible to beat fiber by bouncing satellite to satellite via strategically placed ground stations. When I first looked at this constellation, I assumed SpaceX would spread out the early satellites, like this, to give good coverage. But then all the satellites from the first launch were sent to the same orbital plane. 
Here's what it looks like if you fill six orbital planes. You get these dense bands which give good coverage in a band around 50 degrees north, but intermittent coverage elsewhere. What you do get, though, is great overlap in the coverage between neighbouring satellites, like this. If a ground station has coverage at all, it can reach either two or three satellites pretty much all of the time. That's great for relaying data between satellites. Let's run some simulations and see how this might work. Here we've got just six orbital planes deployed, and we're using the published SpaceX ground station locations, plus a few others I added. Even with relatively few satellites and ground stations, you can get from New York to Seattle quite a bit quicker than the current internet. In fact, latency is pretty similar to optical fibre stretched tight along the best path, which isn't really possible in reality due to things like mountains and right-of-way issues. Now, one thing to remember is that while the orbital planes more or less stay in the same place, the Earth rotates under them once a day. This means that the paths used change over time, and so the best locations for ground stations also change. As more satellites are launched and more orbital planes are filled, not only does coverage become wider, but also the performance of these paths, relayed via the ground stations, also improves. The end-to-end -end latency decreases and becomes significantly less variable. With all 1,584 satellites in the first phase deployed, the latency between New York and Seattle beats fibre all the time. There is still some jitter, but it's only one or two milliseconds. The biggest improvement, though, comes if we add more ground stations. This opens up an intriguing possibility. Starlink user terminals will also use phased array antennas, so they're likely to be able to talk to more than one satellite at a time. Can we use conveniently located user terminals for relays if they're currently idle? Here I've picked locations every 100 kilometers or so. Once SpaceX starts selling servers, there should be hundreds of thousands of locations to choose from, and many will be idle at any time. As the Earth turns, you can see how the choice of best relay changes. Even with relatively few satellites, if you have enough ground stations to choose from, you can roughly halve current internet latencies across the US. As more satellites are added, latency and jitter continue to improve. So, ground stations. The blue line shows what happens. Although latency is better, the best route changes even more user terminals to the pool we choose paths from. But there's very little improvement in latency, and the routes change even more frequently. Now, SpaceX's dedicated ground stations would actually use different frequency bands than their user terminals will. So, if there's a ground station in a reasonable location, it's better to use that rather than taking capacity away from other users. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this here and, and move this along. You can watch the rest of this video, uh, but I think this is a really fascinating concept that they're, they're looking at here, which is that they're going to actually use the terminals on the ground as part of the relay system. So any spare capacity in those terminals, if somebody is not using it, uh, they'll be able to uh, appropriate that uh, bandwidth to help relay these communications from one satellite to another. It just, it's just fascinating to me what they're, what they're doing. This is really cutting edge stuff. It's almost like uh, Elon Musk is just dragging us, uh, kicking and screaming into the 21st century here. It's just amazing what he's doing. So, okay, this is the future. Uh, according to Elon Musk anyway. So let's go through a few things he's been saying here just recently. This is June 29th. Uh, he spoke at a big uh, conference. And uh, so right now, uh, Starlink has about uh, 70,000 active users across 12 countries. Uh, Starlink is going to go global in about five weeks. So from now, it's about four weeks. Uh, so probably sometime in August, uh, they're going to just uh, start lining it up everywhere. And uh, they've launched over 1,500 satellites, and they want to launch a total of 42,000 satellites. 42,000 satellites, all in low Earth orbit. So it's going to get pretty crowded up there. I hope they know what they're doing. Um, right, they're predicting that they're going to have over 500,000 users within 12 months. That's some phenomenal growth. I think uh, HughesNet. Uh, over the life of the HughesNet system, they maybe have uh, close to a million users total, but they've been in business now for 15, 16 years at least. And the terminals, that thing that you saw that guy tear up, um, thousand dollars to make those and the company sells them for you know $500. Um, so they're losing money on the terminals. They'd like to reduce the cost of the terminal from 500 to 200 or 350 or something like that, quote unquote. And Starlink is, uh, he says that, uh, Milo, uh, Elon says that Starlink's gonna need up to $30 billion to survive. 
if we succeed and not go bankrupt, that, then that'll be great. So he's, um, you know, he's rolling the dice on this, but he's sure got some cutting edge technology. It just might make it. Uh, and Starlink should be fully mobile by the end of this year. And this is one that's really attracted to me because, you know, I want to take this thing with me. I want to be able to go up in the mountains or someplace where there is no internet. And I think everybody is, is dreaming about being able to do that. And uh, I called Brian actually yesterday and said, hey, Brian, uh, uh, I might be heading over your way here to kind of test this system out because I haven't had a chance to really uh, go mobile with it. So, uh, and we made it as far as Coloma. <laughs> We got to Coloma, I set it up at Discovery Park, and it wouldn't work. So these things definitely are geofenced. I don't know how far that fence is or in what direction. I found one site that does have these cells kind of mapped out, but apparently that is just uh, somebody's guesswork as to how these actually are kind of geofenced. But some people are not going to wait for it to go mobile. Uh, and that's that geofencing there. That's the cell that we're actually supposed to be in. Uh, and Meadow Vista is at the north end, so my idea was to take it over to, to uh, Brian's house or his office there and set it up in the parking lot and see if we could make it work. But we might leave that for another time. I'm going to have to try a little closer to home first and see how far I can get. And uh, so here's uh, Dishy. That's the name of that antenna. Here's Dishy going mobile. Uh, this, is a <laughs> this is a Toyota Prius that's down in, uh, I think, uh, Antelope Valley somewhere there. And... Uh, this guy who had this uh, on the front of his car and uh, the highway patrol uh, pulled him over and, <laughs> and the officer uh, got out and he said, sir, uh, I stopped you today for that visual obstruction on your hood. Does it not block your view while you're driving? And the driver replied, only one. Okay, so anyway, that uh, that was natural. That's up on their Facebook page there for Antelope Valley CHP, and I've got a link to that too. Pretty funny that somebody even tried to do that. Uh, I would at least have put it on the roof, although maybe he just didn't want to drill holes in the roof. He figured his hood was a little more accessible. So, and uh, this is one more expression here from... Uh, Elon Musk, we're not connecting Tesla cars to Starlink as our terminal is much too big. This is for aircraft, ships, large trucks, and RVs. So sorry, Greg. Uh, no Starlink terminal for you, for your car, at least not this year, maybe later on. And here's the page of uh, resources for all of the, uh, the videos and uh, some of the uh, research material that I pulled up here. And again, this is in a a PDF uh, file, and I've got that link to the PDF file right at the bottom there, uh, the dropbox.com file. We can put this up uh, uh, on the um, SFARC groups IO site as well. So that's pretty much it, folks. Excellent. Leave it to Elon Musk to figure out the uh, speed of light is low enough in a vacuum to offset. It's one point, is a, yeah. Index of refraction, remembering my physics, uh, determines the speed of light. And uh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm glad you noticed that, Greg, because that was a key thing to me. That was the realization in that video. I went, huh, okay, that's right. The speed of light is based upon being in, in space with no obstructions. And when you start pushing it through cables like we do, sphere or fiber optic cables, you've got that velocity factor in there. And he was saying the velocity factor is 50% through a fiber optic cable, which amazes me. Yeah, we have we have velocity factors in coax, same idea, but yeah. from light. And that's why all the the, um, the financial institutions are clustered around the New York Stock Exchange because they can run a fiber, they dig a trench between their their building and the NYSE. And uh, to get the shortest run, so they can get the um, get their trades in. Uh, right. Amazing. Any any questions? I have a question. Uh, yeah, I'm Brian. Yes. Um, so I understand that uh, for some of us, like uh, with the Flex, who use the uh, Smart Link, that this may not work uh, unless we use a VPN because of the uh, double uh, what uh, double NAT. 
Yeah, uh, Brian, we've talked about that a little bit. I have not had a chance to really investigate that or to test that. Um, I know that a VPNs, a VPNs will work on this because the latency is so low. Uh, that's the Achilles heel of any VPN is having a high latency. That's why you can't run them over a regular geosync satellite. Uh, but this uh, system should do it. And actually, in the uh, slide presentation, I clipped it all up uh, just to, to keep this short. But uh, there's a kind of a comparison uh, line by line between QsNet and uh, and this system. And uh, that is in there. But yeah, as to I think somebody's going to have to hook up a flex radio or something and try it out and see if it actually will work. Well, from what I understand, uh, Starlink uses a double NAT, so you don't have a public IP address. Right. And mm -hmm. so this automatic point-to-point, -point, uh, uh, you know, connectivity doesn't exist. So you do have to use a, a VPN. So I'm still on the waiting list, though. I uh, I probably should have pulled the trigger when you did. I was a bit more hesitant, but. Uh, you know whether or not it works directly with the flex and their uh, smart link system it's still uh, you know incredible option so yeah you know i talked to a couple of people who also got that same email that day and they had waited uh, uh, like a day or so and by that time all the slots had been taken i don't know how many were being thrown out there uh, but it was first come first serve and they went really fast yeah hey alan this is uh graden kc6 sla and they actively control the orbits of these satellites or once they position them, are they uh, stuck where they are? Uh, no, they actually, they, they have to have station keeping fuel on all of these satellites. That's true with the geosync stuff as well. Any satellite that's up there uh, worth its salt that's gonna have any longevity, they have to be able to pre-position it and then reposition it as that thing gets blown around by solar winds and all other kinds of things that are going on up there that to us would be insignificant forces, but for a satellite that's up, uh, you know, out of the gravitational pull of the Earth that far, they can be significant forces that can move it. Even just the moon going overhead is going to start pulling these things out of orbit. Well, it's got to be a phenomenal task to keep track of everything that's already up there and where these are in relationship to that. And uh, uh, yeah. how much of a challenge is it going to be in the future to try to launch something through all these? Well, and that's another issue is you're creating this blanket of uh, space debris. And if you have a collision, uh, you're going to have all these little bullets that are flying at 30,000 miles an hour out there that uh, are going to take out other stuff. So it, there could be a, I, I hate to even uh, be a pessimist about it, but there could be a catastrophic failure. It could take out hundreds, thousands of satellites. Except these are much lower orbit. Uh, aren't they? I mean, uh, they must have a, a, a decomposition plan. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but you said these were what, 300 miles up? Uh, about 500 kilometers up, yeah. And uh, that's, not, that's not too far out of the orbit of the International Space Station, for example. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. is anybody yeah. doing any WSJT or any other mode off of these? <laughs> It seems like at a certain point, it, it's going to have some reflective capacity. So people yeah. have bounced signals off the space station. Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you have these things trailing all over, mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of time before somebody's going to start bouncing things passively off of them. Yeah. Uh -oh. I, I got I Greg smiling. <laughs> so if, if I if I can cut in for a quick question, um, is that is that all right? Can I? Oh well, sure, yeah, go ahead, Dan. You know it it does seem geolocked. You mentioned during your presentation, it, uh, for the sub subscription base here, it seems like they're managing the load specifically to a a location. I don't think that this product is going to be transportable between between houses. I think it's locked in to a location. And if you have another location, you have to go ahead and resubscribe for that location. So I, I think that uh, they're managing the load on the satellites that can be used for the, the uh, specific hardware. Um, so it, it does seem very, uh, have, have you found anything out? Uh, you, you mentioned geofencing, right? to how specific the location is that the product services. 
Yeah, there's there's some um, there's a there's a Reddit uh, um, there's a Reddit or a subreddit uh, on Starlink and SpaceX, and uh, on that subreddit, there most of the people that are there that have tried to mess with this and move it around are talking about a radius of about 15 miles that they're able to move it within a certain radius. But the trick is to try and figure out where that radius, where the center of that radius is. You may not be in the center, you may be on the edge of it. And so your 30 mile diameter may extend towards the northeast or, or you may be right in the center and then you only have 15 miles of radius all the way around you. So that's part of it. People are trying to figure that out right now, but it can be moved. Uh, it's just a question of how far can you move it? Uh, in my area, I've moved it a few hundred yards and, and had it just light right back up uh, within maybe 15 minutes. That's the other thing about this is the installation of it was so simple. You put the thing out there, you plug it in and you wait about 10, 15 minutes and it's on the satellite. It, it's, it's passing data. It's working. Do you and, notice a change of throughput as you move outside of the radius? I haven't, see, I haven't tested it enough to, to, to do that, to say, there's no difference between uh, the two locations that I was at that are 300 yards apart. No difference whatsoever. I got good speeds at both of them, as long as there were satellites overhead. It's just one had more obstructions, so it had a greater percentage of, uh, of outage uh, during any given day. But, you you I mean, mentioned, though, you, you weren't able to connect in Coloma? I was not able to connect in Coloma, and I'm not sure if that was pilot error, Brian, because I, I deployed the system out in the parking lot there at the Discovery Park, and we sat in the car because it was so darn hot. Um, and my, in fact, my wife pushed the seat back and went to sleep while I was messing around with this. Finally, after about 15 or 20 minutes, when it just seemed like it wouldn't walk on, I said, well, that's that's enough for today. We'll, we'll, I'm going to spend some more time with this um, later on, and we'll just see. That's kind of like my next... That's my next level of experimenting with this. If I get any time to experiment with it, it's going to be that. Alan? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the satellite dish itself and the weather. It seems to be uh, pretty much horizontal and could uh, collect rain or snow. Uh, how would that affect the signal? Well, it, it, it has, because it's got a computer in there, and you've got uh, probably about 90 to 100 watts of power that's going into that thing, it actually has got uh, some warming in it. And I don't know if it also has some, maybe even a warming circuit in there that could turn on when it's cold, but uh, there are people that are using this in pretty snowy climates. And they say that it does a fairly decent job of keeping the snow off of it. it, it it's tilted so it's gonna melt that snow and it's gonna run off. Obviously, if you have a big snowfall, heavy snowfall, it's not gonna be able to keep up. But I don't have any experience with that because we don't get snow like that here. Okay, so if it were rain, it would just run off then, is that right? Yeah. Thanks. Does the dish move during the, the passes or is it fixed once it gets configured? You know, once it, once it configured itself and it stopped moving, I, don't, I couldn't notice that it moved again, although I would think that as they redeploy these satellites uh, and you know, put them into different orbits and different slots and stuff, that that thing can dynamically readjust to that. It has to be a dynamic system. So, but it's so subtle. I mean, it's it's going to find its sweet spot really quickly, right from the get go. Wow. Okay. Any other questions? Alan, just a quick question. I had understood that when they uh, go to a non-geofence or a more, uh, you know, there is going to be a difference between a system. Uh, they're not a, initially going to be doing a in motion but there will be no additional equipment required uh, once they do this uh, available so you can uh, move outside of the current geofences. Have you read that as well? That there would be a different, different system than what they're doing now? No, initially they will not, uh, op uh, will not offer a mobile in motion system. Oh. It, will, it will just allow the geofence to be lifted for moving your system uh, around. Oh, I see. No. Well, you know, uh, from what uh, Elon said there in that uh, presentation, um, they're intending this thing to go on boats and RVs and and trailer rigs, you know, truck, tractor, trailer rigs. So those are going to be moving systems. Right. And like the initial rollout, I understood, was just going to be 
loosening the geofence and, and so RVers and others can use it while not in motion, but they will go to in motion eventually, but different hardware. So when they, so you're saying that uh, they would drive somewhere and then stop and then the system would take 10 or 20 minutes and, and then re reacquire the satellites. Um, yeah, I, I suppose, I don't know if it's gonna be a sequential rollout or not, um, but you know, the technology to me, because it's, it's, it's riffing off of uh, what cellular technology does, tells me that they could do the system and have both the satellites and the vehicle underneath in motion because the satellites are moving so doggone quick that any, you know, a truck going down the road at 60 miles an hour is practically nothing as far as that satellite. But, uh, you know, that's, that's my, <laughs> that's my understanding of what they're doing. Uh, could be much more complicated, probably is much more complicated than that. My, my guess is they can do it now, but if you're going to be provisioned for the entire system, it's a different product. To, to roll this out and to manage the load, they're, they're managing it specific to a location. I'm sure they can have it so that you can access the grid from wherever you are, but I don't think it's going to be at this price point. I, I think it's gonna be a whole right. different product. Yeah. Be, although he's, he's trying to lower the price of the terminals and they've gotta have some kind of forward thinking about how these terminals are gonna be used. So um, I don't know, maybe there will be a mobile terminal. So, Alan, who regulates all this? Who uh, actually gives Elon the permission, or did he have to buy it to actually use all this space up? What happens if a competitor comes in and wants to park right next to him another 42,000? Well, there are competitors. Uh, OneWeb has got their own system that they're putting up. Uh, that's a partnership between HughesNet and I think uh, Virgin and even Coca Cola, I think, is involved in it. And also, um, um, Qualcomm and Qualcomm, you know, they Qualcomm is one of the big companies in the cellular industry. So there's that system, and then there's another system that uh, that uh, uh, Jeff Bezos is working on. But this has to be regulated on an international level because those satellites are not staying over the United States all the time. Yeah, I I think it's probably the same procedures that anybody who's launching a satellite would have to. I know that they have to make filings with the FCC, and that's mentioned in that one video about uh, what their plans are and how they're going to have these satellites communicate. So obviously, if they're deploying things like lasers and stuff like that, that's also a concern. Okay. Alan, thank you very much for the presentation. Congrats to, uh, to Elon and Starlink uh, for coming up with this thing. I am impressed. Yeah, it's pretty impressive technology. I, I admit, I just, uh, I was pretty overwhelmed by it when I first got it out here. Uh, I, I, you know, from my standpoint, from an industry standpoint, doing HughesNet and so on, this is going to be a game changer. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it puts uh, HughesNet's uh, geosynchronous business out of business. Uh, for one thing, the system is so easy to, to install. You don't need a technician to install it. It's self-installed. Now, that said, I actually have had a couple of people contact me who also had a Starlink system and asked me if I could come over and install it because they weren't comfortable drilling a hole through the wall and uh, things like that. So there's always going to be some room in there for uh, a technician to come in and, 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 and do a proper install. After but, the uh, man fell off the ladder that he called, <laughs> his wife called? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I don't want him climbing up on the roof, so that's why I'm calling you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Alan. You bet, uh, fellas. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right.